Today's lesson is going to be a little bit different because I want today's lesson to be something that every one of us can work on. I want to tell you at the onset of today's lesson, this is something my family can work on. And I know that if we're honest for all of us, this is something that we all as families can work on. And what we're going to do today is we're going to illustrate a few things to ourselves. I promise you by the time this is over, this will make a large amount of, time, amount of sense, but we want to get to this little phase right here. Because this is the phase that we're trying to get to, and, and when I explain this in just a moment, you will understand exactly what all of these elements mean, and you'll be able to make an application to yourself as you live and as I live of what these things mean and how you and I can add them to the way we live and add them to how we live in the future. Because what we're talking about is the idea of how we're running out of time. And I don't know if this exists in your family, but it does in mine. Have you ever had to say, we just don't have time for that? Matter of fact, this week, yesterday, we came to the point in our family where we had to say, we just don't have time for that. It was something that we wanted to do. It wasn't something that really mattered, but it was something we wanted to do, and, and, and we had to make that phrase, that we just don't have time for that. So I know that happens in my family, and, and there's something that I know about you. It happens in your family. It happens in your personal lives. Have you ever had something that you really wanted to do personally, you know, the rest of your family or everybody else didn't really, it wasn't really bothered by or really didn't want to do that thing, but you wanted to, and you, you came to the end of that day, and you just did not have enough time. You see, time is what we're battling in life. I, I used to think that the devil would use all these different areas to get us. But, but I'm coming to be, become a believer that the single area that the devil works at his hardest is time. Because if he can run us out of time, eventually we will run out of time for God. And doesn't that happen to us in life? We do all these other things, we make all these other plans and the person that usually pays the price is God. Because we move him out of our time and we run out of time. So I want you to see some things. Now, this particular chart has to do with people who are 25, year old, 25 years old to 54 year old with children. And this is how they spend their time in their daily lives. About 7.6 hours is dedicated to sleep. Now, I'm not sure what children they have, but theirs are doing really well. They're getting 7.6 hours of sleep. They spend about 8.6 hours of their regular average day at work. So you already understand that as we're talking about this, a big chunk of time has been spent in sleep and in work. Now, we all understand sleep. Everybody loves sleep. Not everybody loves work. But both of those things have to be had in life, don't we? We have to sleep to keep ourselves alive, don't we? To keep ourselves full of energy to get through the days. But we also have to work, don't we? Fathers, you have to work to take care of your families. You are the one in the Bible that is commanded to provide for your family. Not for someone else's family, not for everybody else's family, for your family. So these two categories are really important. But what's interesting to me is how we spend our time in the other categories. They say the person that's 25 to 54 spends 2.6 hours every day or in a regular week of 24 hours a day in leisure and sports activities. Now, you and I understand that's true. In the day and age we live, we all have something that we like to do. We all have a hobby that we love to do. That's this category. And we spend a pretty good amount of time doing the thing that we love. And this is true in all of our lives. The thing you love and the thing that I love, I'm going to spend and you're going to spend the most time doing that thing. That reflects in the survey across America of the way people live. They spend about 1.1 hours on household activities. Now listen to this. We spend 1.1 hour a day eating and drinking. That's pretty staggering to me. I don't know how they came up with that, but 1.1 hours is how much we spend. We spend 1.2 hours caring for others. And then there's a category called other that's about 1.8 hours that really didn't fit any other category, so they called it other. So the average person, 25 to 54, with children, spends this amount of time in their life. That's 24 hours every day. Now, what I found interesting is when you get to the college age, I just want to point this out to you, the, the, the things are very the same. They spend 8.4 hours sleeping. They spend 3.6 hours in leisure activities. But I want you to see something. They spend 0.8 hours grooming. I thought that was interesting. 
At a certain phase in your life, remember, do you remember being younger? You remember wanting to look nice, to be nice, to be around people who look nice. It's interesting to me that we spend time doing the things that we really want to do. And I, I'm impressed that college-age students and university students spend almost an hour every day trying to make themselves look nice. That's interesting to me. We spend time doing what we like. You see, so in, in all of this time, we, we do what we want. Now, in that leisure time, uh, this is if you have a total of five hours, and, and this particular chart varies from difference and from time to time, but, but we spend about 2.7 hours on, on occasions. This is in a typical week's worth of leisure time. We spend about 2.7 hours watching television. Now, does anyone disagree with that statistic? And the reality is we don't because we really watch a lot of television. Matter of fact, some of us, and there's a lot of us that do this, we just have the TV on just so the noise will be on in our homes. We spend a lot of time in entertainment. And as you break this down, we spend time communicating, we spend time reading, we spend time doing this and doing that. We spend a lot of time doing what we want to do. Now, there's something that's interesting about this to me. Did you notice anything about the, the first two charts, the the 25-year-old, 24-year-old, to 54-year-old, and the college-age student. D did you see anything or notice anything about those charts that seemed particularly interesting to you? And the answer is you probably did. You probably thought like me, boy, it's, it's odd that 0.8 hours is spent grooming. Or, or, or this many hours sleeping, or, or 1.1 hours. That's how much we spend eating. Now, that's interesting to me, but I believe there's something more startling in that set of charts that was not mentioned than that which was mentioned. Did you notice on all of those charts, and it exists on all, all, all two of them, and, and even the leisure chart, God was left out. Of all the things we do in a regular, average, 24-hour day, as an American, God was never mentioned. You see, what we're battling is we're battling time. Now, of these people that were already mentioned in these charts, 73% of Americans, in a total of America, define as Christian. 20% of Americans define themselves as they have no faith. 6% of Americans define themselves as if they are other religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, being a Muslim. As a matter of fact, we knocked on a door in our community this Saturday, and the man said... I can't go. I'm a Muslim. You see, even in our own community, there are people who identify with some other form of faith. And then there's 1% of Americans who are really not sure what they are, what they want to be, or even if they want to be religious or not. Now, among the people who live in the United States, and this is of those in that chart, of those people who went to church, now interestingly enough, they define a regular member of a congregation as someone who is in a pew at least once a month. That's how we define a regular attender in the United States, is someone who comes to church services at least once a month. Now, I don't agree with that. I don't define that as a regular attender. I, I don't think you define that as a regular attender. I define someone who regularly attends the worship services as someone who is regularly there when the doors are open. I think you understand what that means, and I know I believe, I think you believe that. But of this, seven out of ten people see it very important that they attend and that their children attend worship services of some form. 69% of people say, or 69% of people say that, Similarly, those people who attend say they go to be a better person. So I started looking at some things and trying to figure out, well, why do people go to church? And, and why are people, and what, what does these statistical groups have to do with anything inside of our lives? So what I found is 71% of the people in America who say they go to church once a month say they pray on a regular daily basis. 56% of those people who attend one worship service once a month, are women. Fifty-five percent of those who attend one worship service once a month are 50 and older. And that was actually a very encouraging statistic. I was afraid that one was going to be much higher, didn't you? If you look over the religious scenes of the world, it seems that most older people are religious and most younger people are being taught out of it. I think that statistic helps us understand that that's not always the case. 
31% of these people were college graduates. I think that's also important for us to know. You, you need to know what you're discussing when you're looking at it. Now, inside of America, according to Christianity Today, they, they did a survey of all of those people who attend one service once a month, and they wanted to know why those people attended those services. They found that 81% of people said they go to services to draw closer to God. I think that's a very reasonable expectation of going to worship or attending a religious service. 69% of people come so that their children will have a moral foundation. You know, I'm, I'm very glad that that ranked high because I'm telling you, if you want your children to have a moral foundation, here's where it begins. There will never be a day when we should run out of time for our children. But think about this. There should never be a day when we run out of time for our children's future in eternity. 69% of people inside of this survey, it was a rather large survey, said they went so their children would have a moral foundation. 68% said they wanted to be a better person. 66% said they want, they want to find comfort in times of trouble. And I think that's true. In our world, when tragedy strikes, church buildings fail. I'm not saying all these statistics are good, but they are true, and they do happen. 57% come to be valuable in, or find a community in faith. 37% come to continue the family's religious traditions. Now, that one scares me. 37% of people who attend worship at least once a month, one time a month, go to continue a family tradition. I want to ask you a question. Now, this is not a verbal question, so you don't have to answer it, but is this a family tradition? It's not a family tradition, is it? This is a godly tradition. This is from God, and what we do is not a tradition per se in our families. Some people go to meet, and other people go to please their spouse. 16% of those go to please their spouse, their family, or somebody else inside of their lives. That's why they attend services. Now, it's interesting to me that the same thing follows true on why people don't go to church. It's interesting to me that 37% of, of people say they practice their faith in some other way. In other words, what they're saying is, I don't need worship, I don't need Bible study, I will be religious or I will be spiritual in some other form and fashion. Some say, this is 23% of people that go to church at least once a time, who don't go to church actually, say they, they haven't found a church or a house of worship that they like. That's interesting to me that they don't like. Some people say they don't like the sermons, that's 18% of people. 14% uh, don't feel welcome. 28% uh, say they don't believe in God. 12% of people say, listen to this, I don't have the time. 9% say they're in poor health or it's difficult for them to get around. Some say, this is 7% of people, there's not a church in my area. Now, that, that is true in certain parts of the world. That's not, a, not true for you and me, is it? It's not true for you and me. And 26% and of people say there's no reason why they do not attend services. So, so what you and I have in, in recognition is we understand how our world spends its time. We know that. We understand that, that God in most people's minds is not a priority, but, but that's not really what I want to discuss, is it? It's not. It, it, it's not what I want to discuss because this lesson is more about time, but it's more about our time. Or less about time, it's less about our time, but it's more about our priorities. You and I have been given time every day. And every day, that 24-hour cycle starts over if we're blessed to live another day. And this is what I want you to see because I, I don't think we play this out in our minds enough. And we certainly don't do it to where we recognize it in the way that we live. So I want to do something with you that will help you illustrate this in your mind so that you will see it. Because when I, when I laid this out for myself last night to see if this was going to work, it really made a visual impact on how we place God. And what I want to do is, I, I want you to see three different scenarios. Two are very popular. Two are very popular. And one of them is a choice. Now, all of these things have to do with time, the way we live our lives, what we're doing with our time. And here's the first one. This is how much time that you and I spend asleep. Now, each one of us is given every day 24 hours. And we're going to fill that 24 hours with something inside of our lives. So we spend a good portion of our time sleeping. And what we do is, that's a foundational thing, isn't it? Every one of us needs to sleep. Now, sometimes we spend more time sleeping. Sometimes we spend less time speaking, sleeping. But this is in an average life. Of your day, there is the time that you have spent asleep in 24 hours. 
Now, I'm not here to tell you that when you go to sleep, you've got to make God a priority. That's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to illustrate to you what we do with our time. And then we're going to look at two passages that will lay this out for us very well. Or not. So we spend about eight hours, nine hours sleeping. We spend about eight or nine hours working. So what you can see is, as we've already illustrated, this time that we have, these 24 hours, slowly has begun to fill up, hasn't it? You had 24 hours when you began. Your, your time is now short, isn't it? After you sleep and after you go to work, you don't have that much time left for you. Now, this is in the average life of someone who does work. Now, I understand that, that when you retire, the workscape changes. Sometimes even when you retire, the sleep changes. So this is in the average person that works inside of our lives, an average life, because I'm trying to illustrate to us that what we make as a priority is going to take the bulk of our time. Now, in our lives, we spend about three hours in our homes, doing things in our homes, caring for loved ones, taking care of others. If you have children, you spend a lot of your time taking care of children. How many of you feel like you always spend your time picking up your house when your children are awake? That's what you spend a lot of time. So by the time you spend your time taking care of your home, your time has run short, hasn't it? You went to sleep, you went to work, you, you, you've, now, you've now gone to taking care of your home. The next thing we do is leisure time. We spend a lot of leisure time. It's things we want to do. We spend a lot of time doing the things we want to do. And by the time you add that leisure time in there, you really start to run out of time, don't you? We're almost out of time, aren't we? Do you see how much time we have left? It, it, it's very small. Now, I'm trying to illustrate something to you, that we spend our time doing the things that we want to do. And by the time... We spend about the hour and a half to three hours we have left in our day doing the other things. How much time do we have left? I'm out of time. You're out of time. I went to sleep. I went to work. I took care of my family. I did the things I wanted to, and I did the other things that I had to do in my life. And by the time that happened, I was out of time, wasn't I? And we don't really think about our days that way very often, do we? You don't ever look at your day and segment it in something that's visual, do you? But boy, that really tells you a story, doesn't it? What you do with your time, number one, is through your choices. But number two, what you do with your time is your priority. Now, there's three things we're trying to do. Number one, there's two popular ways people fill their time. This is the most popular. What's missing in that time frame? God's missing in that time frame. Now, the second most popular thing to do inside of time is this. What we try to do is we try to take God in the scope of our time and we try to fit him in. We've already filled up all of our time and what we do with the, the very remaining minutes left, we try to take the smallest of time and we try to fill, fill God up with him. What we're doing is we're spending one hour, this is one hour, significant to your day. Now, if you spend seven days, which is what we're doing right here, we're, we're kind of going a little bit off of, our, off of our illustration, but if you spend seven days, one hour a day, and you took one hour of all those seven days, and you filled your life, or tried to fill your life with what you wanted to do, and then tried to fill it up with God, let me ask you a question. Where's God? He's not a priority, is he? These are the two popular ways to live. Number one, you live without God. Number two, you try to fit God in to your life. Now, I'm here to tell you those are the popular ways. Those are the popular ways to live. Fill up your life. Don't worry about God. I'm not trying to be flippant about people who do not believe in God or people who have put him on the back burner. I'm not trying to be that way. Number two, you, you, you fill up your life and then you try to fit God in your life. And those are the two popular ways of which people live. Now, if you and I are honest, sometimes we fit in that second category. We fill up our lives. We run out of time. We even say we're running out of time. And God pays the price. But really who's paying the price is you. But, but here's, here's the real way we need to live our lives, okay? Okay. We need to live every moment 
as if God is in our life and as if we've put our lives inside of God. Now, I know when you go to sleep, there's not much you can do to honor God, but you can, when you go to sleep, pray to God, can't you? For the day that you just had. When you wake up from that period of sleep, can you not be thankful that you were able to wake up? One man said, it's not the alarm clock that wakes you up, it's God Almighty. When you go to work, cannot God be a priority for you in your work? You see, the way we work, the way we live, God should be a priority for us. Can you not be the voice to tell someone else about God while you're at work? Can God not be a part of the thought process of you while you're in work? The answer is He can, if we let God be the priority in our lives. When we come to our homes, which is the pink layer here, can God not be the priority in your home? He can, can He? When you sit down to eat meals with your family, what can you do? You can pray. When it's time to go to bed, I know that's back in that sleep schedule, but parents, you can pray with your children. You can put God first in your home. When it comes to your leisure time, now that's very hard to, to put God inside your leisure time because here, here's what you're doing. You're, you're doing things that you love. But what you have to do is put what you love behind God. In other words, don't wait, let what you love in this world put God out of your time schedule so you don't have time for Him. And then any the other things that we do in our lives, is it not possible for us to put God in those things? For us to not let the things that we love, we just don't have anywhere to put them in a category, to put God out of place? You see, if we're not paying attention, if we're, if we're not careful in our lives, we, we'll live like the popular ways. And we'll try to give God none of our time or we'll try to give God some of our time when we have some time left over. But I'm here to tell you, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, all time belongs to God. How much of time are you devoting to God? That's the lesson for you and me today. But what we've got to do is we, we've got to look at some passages, and, and this is going to help us illustrate exactly what we're doing. Now, there's two passages I want you to see. The first comes in the book of Matthew. Go into Matthew chapter 6. And I want to keep this illustration before us so we can see this. Matthew chapter 6, this is, this is going all the way down to verse 34. It's the last verse of the chapter. And very interestingly connected to Matthew chapter 6 is Luke chapter 12 that we're going to go to in just a moment. But I want you to see what happens in verse 34 of Matthew, or 24, correction, Matthew chapter 6 verse 34. Matthew 6, 34. And we'll go ahead and add verse 24 into it as well. It's a good verse to add to this thought. Verse 34 reads this way, there, or Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Go to verse 24 in Matthew chapter 6. No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon is just a fancy word for wealth. Money of the world. How much time do we spend trying to make money in our lives? You know, we like to tell ourselves that we, we, we don't spend our time loving money. But how many times as families, as individuals, as groups of people, do we extend ourselves financially and then enslave ourselves to work to where it has to be the priority? How many times do we buy, buy, and buy so we can have, have, and have, and then we owe, owe, owe? You see, we allowed money, whether we realized it or not, possessions to become the root of our lives. And what we learn in Matthew 6, 24, and inside of verse 34 is there is time. But if we put God in the forefront of our time, we've already lived a blessed life. But go over in connection with this to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I want you to see something about time inside of Luke chapter 12, something about priorities. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to start with me in verse 13. Because I need you to see a man before we can really get to the true value of what we're discussing that has to do with our time. You see, we sleep, we work, we take care of our families, we do all these other things. Where's God in all of these things? This will help us. Start with me in verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, this is Jesus, speak to my brother that he may divide the inheritance with me. Now I don't ask this to be flippant, to be disrespectful or to be mean or un unkind, but at the death of a loved one, 
when money is involved, pardon the way I'm going to say this, but sometimes claws come out, don't they? And here was a man who was in the, in the presence of Jesus. He calls him master and he says, tell my brother to be fair. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. What was this about? It's about money. It's about money. So I, I just want you to see this about money for just a minute. And, and Jesus asked him, man, who, are you, who, who made you or made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said, take heed, there we, and, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists of not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Verse 15. That's a very good important thing. Many times we allow possessions to drive us out of our time. Verse 16. He spoke this parable unto them. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself saying, What shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say unto my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. What occupied that man's time in Luke chapter 12? What occupied his time? His possessions. And all he could think about was how he was going to tear down his barns to build bigger barns. How he was going to talk to himself and tell himself, Self, take it easy because you're set. How many times do we live our lives so we can tell ourselves, take it easy, you're set. You got the money you need, you got the house you need, you got the possessions you need. How many times do we live time-oriented to money? And if we're honest, the reality is we live that way quite a bit. Thus, we still know who the Joneses are in our lives. So, verse 20, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul will be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be which thou hast provided? There's an old saying that says you can't take a U-Haul behind a hearse. And the adage behind that saying is that there's nothing in this life, in the physical sphere, that we're going to take with us. The only thing you're going to take with you is your name and your name will tell what your deeds were in this life. It's not in the physical abundance of things. It's not in the money. It's not in the priorities of all these things that Jesus is discussing right here in Luke chapter 12. And thus Jesus in verse 22 dives into this area. And he says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life, verse 23, is more than meat, and the body more than raiment. This is a side question for just a minute, but what makes you a Christian? Now listen, I'm, I'm going to show you something that I think we need to recognize, okay? This suit that I'm wearing does not make me godly. The tie that I'm wearing does not make me religious. The pew that I occupy does not make me spiritual. But my life will either approve or condemn me inside the Lord. Now, I'm not standing up here this morning telling you we should never wear a suit again. That's not what I'm saying. When we come to the Lord's house, we should be respectable. And we should put our best foot forward when we come to the Lord's house. That we can do. I'm not saying every man needs to wear a suit in this room. But we should put our best foot forward when it comes to the Lord. Do you see what's happening with our time? With our time, do we put our best foot forward with the Lord? You see, he's telling them here in their lives, there's more than what you eat than meat and more to the body than raiment. I love verse 24. Consider the ravens, where they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouses nor barn, and God feedeth them, how much more are ye better than the fowls? So the birds of the air, he says. Have you ever seen a bird build a barn? That's an interesting thought, isn't it? From Luke chapter 12, verse 24. Have you ever seen a bird build a barn? I haven't seen that. You haven't either, have you? I've never seen that. But yet God provides for them. You go down into verse 25. And which of you taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? You ever wanted to be taller? 
I will profess to you that I have wanted to be taller. And I have still not figured out how to add a cubit or a foot to my height. If I did, I'd be taller. But there's something that's interesting to me. I can't do that. And neither can you. I love verse 26. If you then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take thought of the rest? If you can't even make yourself taller, why are you concerned with all of these things that just simply don't matter? I'm here to tell you that has to do with your time. And we'll illustrate that in just a minute. He says, verse 27, Consider the lilies, how they grow and they toil not, and they spin not. Yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these, the richest man ever on the earth. Solomon. Man full of wisdom. Yet the lilies in the field are arrayed better than he is. And yet God takes care of the lilies of the field. Verse 28, If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? Now listen to this. O ye of little faith. And he tells them that they're seeking after the wrong things down to verse 30. Now get to verse 31. This is where we need to see. This is the true value. And this is where we're going to put the time in this. But rather seek the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added unto you. What are these things? All the things that you need goes all the way back up. I believe that the context of what Jesus was saying, there was a man who needed to build bigger barns. What did he have? He had the supplies he needed in this life. It goes back to what Jesus was saying in verse 23 about the meat and the body, about the raiment and life. It's about the ravens who God's take care of. It's about the height that one man's trying to add to himself. It's about the lilies of the field. What's the idea here? God always takes care of his own. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, what does that have to do with time? Well, we've illustrated three areas of time today. Two of those areas, God was last. Let me tell you, God will always be last if you try to fit him into your schedule. Because what you love will always take priority over God if he's not first. And you'll be that person who's trying to fit God into that glass of time. And all those other things are going to take a priority over God, and and God will be unrecognizable in your life to you and to others. Aren't we told to be that which shines forth the glory of God? How can we do that if He's not a priority? The answer is we can't. He says, seek after this. Listen to verse 32. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, give alms, provide yourselves bags which wax not old, and treasure a treasure in the heavens that fadeth not, where no thief approacheth nor moth corrupt. Verse 33. You know, people are wicked in this life. And garments don't last. Have you ever pulled a shirt out of the closet and there was a hole in it? Boy, didn't that just irritate you? Because something ate a hole in it or maybe it was torn. Physical things don't last. Physical don't think things don't last in the second place because men steal. That happened recently in our community. Someone stole from another. It wasn't theirs, but they stole it. And now those physical possessions are no more. Probably never to be seen again. He says in this particular area, he said, he said that's not where it is. That's not where things exist in life. Now listen to verse 34. This is the key of it. For where your treasure is... There will your heart be also. I only have one question to ask you today. It's less about time. And it's more about your priorities. Where's God in your life? Are you fitting Him in? Are you fitting God into your life? You fill up your day and and you realize somewhere in your life you've got to have God. Are you fitting Him in? Or did you even think about Him in your day? Did you even think about Him? Or, number three, the unpopular thing, in everything that you do, is God considered a priority in your life? 
You see, that's why Luke chapter 12, verse 34, is such a priority to you and me. Because verse 34 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where's your treasure? I'm not asking you where's your money. I'm not asking you what your pride and joy is. I'm asking you if you want to go to heaven. We have so much time. And we fill that time with the things that we love. And that's how we live. But what we've got to do is we've got to recognize that we're not running out of time. That what we've really been doing is we've been running out of God. And we're the ones that have been running God out of our lives because we felt like we were running out of time. Because we didn't know where our treasure was. I'm telling you, true treasure's in heaven. You may not be a millionaire in this life. That's okay. You may not have the best job that everybody respects, and that's okay. What we've learned today is 18% of people come to church and they don't like the sermon. It's understandable. You may not have the best job in the world. That's okay. You may not have the biggest house on your street. That's okay. You may not have the nicest car in the parking lot. That's okay. But you can go to heaven. Because you've taken your time, which is really a treasure, and you've put it in heaven. But in this, there's also a concept of we are running out of time. There is really the concept that we are running out of time because you and I don't know when the Lord's going to come back. Time is limited. We also don't know how long we're going to live. I don't know how long I'm going to live. I have a, I have a goal in my life, as most of you do. But I don't know. You don't know. And how I spend my time is going to matter. And what I do with my time, it's not going to matter. It does matter. Because heaven is real. But just as much as heaven is real, the Lord said he prepared hell for the devil and his angels. If I put God second place, I'll never be with him. And he'll never be with me. Running out of time. That's a true statement. Bill has picked out a song for us to sing. And thankfully we have this moment of time to evaluate our lives, to determine how we live. And listen, we have time to make a change today. Maybe you're like the majority of the world. And you're just trying to fit him in. You can change that. Maybe you're like another part of the majority of the world and God never really comes into, into the scope of your time. You can change that. Or maybe there's something in your life that you've filled your life with that's sinful. You can change that today. James 5.16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That tells you and me that when God's people are together and when one of God's people needs to come back home, prayers can be made and God will forgive. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe it's you this morning that needs to become a child of God. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Only in God's word can you learn how to become a child of God. And let me tell you this, only in God's word can you learn how to structure your life. Because without God, you'll live without God. You can become a child of God by listening to his word, hearing it, believing it, repenting of your past sins, confessing the name of Christ, and being immersed into water, and water's ready for you. Clothes for you to change in are ready. Towels are ready for you to dry off. If you need a hair dryer, we even have that. Everything's ready for you. If you are, and you can make your way down during the invitation song and you can become a child of God today, maybe that's your need. Maybe you need to come back to the Lord. You have to decide that. You have to decide what becomes a priority in your time. Every day we have 24 hours. Where is God in your life? Let's stand and sing and respond.